Really quick before we get started with today's video, I wanted to remind y'all that today, August 31st at 9 a.m. PST, I'll be going live over on my Twitch channel with a very special 10 hour plus charity stream for Autism Speaks. I plan on doing all kinds of amazing things from Vanguard Zero to Pokemon speedruns to maybe even some Pokemon TCG Online. Links will be down below for both the charity campaign as well as my Twitch channel. So definitely come stop by after you're done watching this video and we can have an amazing time supporting an amazing cause. But with that being said, you guys, I think it's time for my best decks meta forecast for Carpet Vanguard Zero set seven format. If you guys are new to my channel and don't know how this video series works, basically I do three things. The first thing I do is I go over all the brand new cards that are coming out in the upcoming set for the global server. The next thing I do is I talk about these decks strengths and weaknesses and I kind of discuss the differences between the mentality of global meta players and JP meta players and how that might affect the viability of certain decks that are, that are coming out. And the last thing that I do is at the very end of the video, I'll be giving you guys my top three predictions for what I believe the best decks are going to be for the set seven format in Carbide Vanguard Zero. And today's video is going to be actually a very special one because not only do we have the arrival of Aqua Force, one of the most hyped clans of hype clans in Carbide Vanguard Zero, but also we have a very big difference with our global meta compared to the Japanese meta that I cannot wait to talk about. So strapping you guys is going to be a good one. If you guys are excited, be sure to leave a like on this video, subscribe to the channel and click that bell from notifications so that you guys know when my videos go live for you. I think like 50-ish percent of you guys aren't actually subscribed that watch these videos. So just know that I do post videos five times a week. I do all kinds of TCG and Vanguard Zero related stuff. So if you guys are interested in that kind of stuff, definitely consider subscribing. It's always an option. But with all that being said, you guys, I think it's time I hopped into the Vanguard Zero meta database and talked about all these new cards. All right, boys and girls, here we are at VanguardZeroMeta.com, my go-to website for looking up what brand new cards are coming out, as well as refreshing myself with any new skills uh, for cards that I can't really remember. Uh, and the first clan we're going to be talking about that comes out in the brand new set, remember, we're getting Aqua Force, Great Nature, Angel Feather, Runa Triangle, and Dimension Police, as well as a sixth clan that I'll be talking about that is one of the big differences between the Japanese and English metas. We'll get to that in a second. And the biggest clan that's coming out is Aqua Force, and that's what I'm going to talk about first. Now, if you guys are unfamiliar with Aqua Force and the way it works, basically, it is an aggressive tempo slash advantage clan that is disguised as a multi-attack clan. What do I mean by this? Well, basically, the way Aqua Force works is they have two main modes. They have cards that enable multi-attacks, and then they have cards that have effects as a result of having certain battle requirements. So, for example, we have Marine General of the Restless Tides, Algos, and he has two skills. Vanguard Rearguard, when this unit attack hits a Vanguard, if it is the fourth battle of that turn or more, draw a card. So this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. They have these wave or battle thresholds that they need to hit in order to activate certain skills. And oftentimes, these skills have to deal with either gaining power, drawing cards, or retiring your opponent's Rearguards. Especially with these cards that are being released in the Set 7 set, the Aqua Force Clan is really going to be focused on having hardcore advantage and then leveraging its multi-attacks as a way to get extra damage against the Opponent, that's gonna be the main play style of this deck. Now that we know that, let's talk about some of the big key cards for this archetype. First one is gonna be their main boss unit, Blue Storm Dragon Maelstrom. If you wanna play this deck on day one, you gotta pick up four of these boys because this is the go-to card to get. Uh, lucky for you guys though, if you want to maybe grind this deck up slower, he will be a rank ward in future seasons, so there you go. He has two main skills. His first skill is his limb break skill, Vanguard Circle, limb break four, and this unit attacks a Vanguard. If it is the fourth battle of that turn or more, it gets power plus 5k and gains the following ability until end of that battle. Vanguard Circle, at the end of that battle, this unit attack, draw a card, and retire one of your opponent's rear guards. Now, this is a really good skill. It's essentially a plus two if you consider minusing your opponent a plus one for yourself, but it's also a really big buff to Maelstrom because back in the day, in the real life card game, his skill was on hit. And it was not just automatic so this is super huge uh, that automatic retire is going to be really good for certain matchups especially in the set 7 format you have a really good gold paladin matchup because you can grind them out especially if it's spec duke and it just makes it to where this deck essentially plays like a blue version of kagero and honestly it's a really cool play style 
Now, obviously, it's not the most aggressive card in the world. He still gains a lot of power because the second skill says when this unit attacks a Vanguard, he gets power plus 3,000 to end of that battle. Really cool. So he essentially gains 8k uh, by himself, who's a 19k swing. If he has a 7k boost, that's 26. Super dope. This card kind of sums up kind of why I think people love Aqua Force because it not only has a lot of really good advantage based options, but you can use that advantage to then fuel all your really aggressive options like your Storm Riders or in the future, Glory Maelstrom. This, along with how popular this clan is in general because of characters in the anime, as well as just how cool it is, uh, the aesthetic and everything, makes this deck one of the most popular and I think tier 1 decks for the foreseeable future in Carpet Vanguard Zero. In fact, I'm pretty sure it did super well in the current Vanguard Zero Championships, and they're in set 10 format almost, so that's just like a gauge for you on how good Aqua Force is going to be. Some of the key cards we have is we have the other triple rares, Storm Rider Diamantes, as well as Naval Gazer Dragon. Now, Naval Gazer Dragon sort of serves as your backup ride to Maelstrom. He's another limit break card. Uh, when this unit attack hits a Vanguard, he gets power plus 3k. And if this is the third battle of that turn or more, so it's a little bit easier, uh, it gets the following ability. When this unit attack hits, count last two and stand two of your rear guards. This is definitely a more aggressive ability uh, than Blue Storm Dragon Maelstrom. And so while it is very strong, I don't think it'll be the preferred way to build Aqua Force, I think it'll serve as like the 13th grade three on top of your Storm Riders, but you could run like four of these and have it be like a pure backup ride because if you're not on Maelstrom, being on Naval Gazer isn't that bad. And then we have Storm Rider Diamantes. Now him along with Basil have the exact same effect, uh, except he's a grade two. So the effect is as follows. Rear Guard Circle, when this unit attacks a Vanguard, if it is the first battle of that turn or more, it gets power plus 3k until end of that battle. At the end of that battle, this unit exchanges positions with your rear guard in the same column. Now, before I talk about anything else, this is gonna be the main way that we get multi-attacks with Aqua Force, especially until, basically until we get break ride support in the future. So definitely get four copies of these as well as four copies of Basil. They have the same exact effect. Now, a way to picture this is basically like you have Diamantes in the front row and then you have some other card in the back row. It doesn't matter what it is. It's preferred if it's if, if, it's preferred to be at least 9,000 powers. So that way it can swing at something when it comes to the front row. And then when Diamantes swings for the first battle of that turn, you then switch. Boom, you have the new card up here. He's ready to attack. You swing with him. Doesn't matter if it hits or not. It still counts as a battle. Therefore, you can reach your battle requirement for cards like Maelstrom, uh, Valeria, uh, Algos, etc. This is a really powerful skill and adds a lot to your consistency. And then his second effect is actually a brand new effect. Uh, rear guard circle once per turn, catalyst one until end of turn. If it is the first battle of that turn, this unit can ignore intercepts when attacking. So this is really important because as you can tell, uh, Diamantes and Basil have the little text there that says when it attacks a Vanguard and in zero, if they have intercepts, you can't attack the Vanguard. So this allows them to ignore that. And honestly, it creates a lot of aggression against the opponent because in the late game, if you have five damage, these dudes can just swing at you and just eat out a PG, which is super good. So that's a really nice buff to these cards. I like it. And like I said, guys, Basil's the exact same thing as the Amantis, just grade two and double rare. So that's pretty much it for the main cards of Aqua Force, as well as like how they want to play. Um, some things I want to talk about and like what it has going for it, basically for set seven format in particular, is it has a really good early and late game. It's mid game is as good as it always is for a limb break deck. You know, if you don't see damage enablers, oh well. But in the late game, you're going, you're grinding, you're, you're getting rid of your opponent's units and you're attacking a bunch, super nice. And then the early game, you actually have really cool rush potential because of cards like Storm Rider Basil, allowing you to get extra attacks in the early game. Cards like Coral Assault and uh, Tier Knight Valeria, not only gaining power, but also retiring your opponent's rear guards uh, in the like, like first two or three turns in the game, which is super strong for you. So this gives you a really powerful early game that people do utilize in order to rush their opponents. Really good. On top of that, pretty much all the cards got a big buff in terms of power gain, in terms of just playability. We still have Light Signals Penguin Soldier, who's a god in Aqua Force, uh, which is super nice. And I really do love this deck moving forward. And honestly, I'm really excited to play with it because I've never played Aqua Force before in real life. And so getting to play it in zero when it's gonna be like a really powerful deck, I'm honestly super excited. Moving on we have the second biggest clan being supported in set seven we have dimension police specifically dimension police gets two new archetypes supported the main one is going to be the dimensional robo archetype it actually becomes an archetype now where it has like cards specifically referencing dimensional robo in their name and then you get the galactic beast archetype specifically specifically zeal and his ride chain now a couple of things i want to talk about here first is the buff 
to Daiyusha. It hasn't been announced yet in the like announced or anything, but I'm pretty sure we're gonna get it on release of set seven like JP did, and he gets these brand new effects. So originally, kind of last two game 2K, all the same. Uh, 14, 14 or more gonna crit all the same, but now he gets a brand new effect that says hand, remove this card, discard it, to add a die battles, a die lander, a die mariner, or a die dragon to your hand at random. So this is a really cool sort of utility option for Dayusha because the way dimensional robos work is you wanna have a bunch of them that you can ride on top of to have plenty in your soul so that way you can have the access to ultimate dimensional robo great Dayusha's cross ride numbers as well as his limit break. In this, in zero, it's really easy to get this off, especially with how many dimensional robos you get access to as of, as of the set and with this brand new Dayusha skill. So not only does this skill add to your main synergy point, but because Dayusha effectively becomes a dead car in the late game after you cross ride, you can just discard any Dayushas you don't need and dig for intercepts, dig for boosters, dig for power gainers once you use Goyusha. It's a really awesome utility addition to this already super aggressive card, and it's a nice buff. Just want to get that buff out of the way before we talk about the new cards. Biggest non-grade three dimensional robo I would have to say is definitely Goyusha because he has an amazing skill of if you have a grade two or greater Vanguard dimensional robo, put four of your dimensional robo rear guards into your soul to ride a Dayusha from your deck and draw two cards. Super powerful effect, lets you accelerate your grade three, possibly accelerate crits thanks to Dayusha's skill, and you can essentially on your first grade three ride, technically, get cross ride numbers thanks to ultimate Dayusha, which is amazing. So I really love Goyusha for the utility slash the aggression he gives this deck in the early game. All right, moving on to the big justice boy himself. We have ultimate dimensional robo great Dayusha. This is gonna be the big card for the set for Dimension Police. He has the Vanguard Circle and Break 4 when this unit attacks. If you you have two or more dimensional robos in your soul it gets power plus 2000 and plus one critical so it's a guaranteed critical he also has cross ride with regular Dayusha in the soul so it becomes a 15k swinger if you have a 6k or even 7k booster he hits magic numbers with a crit every single turn he's essentially dimension police MLB but he has cross ride numbers instead of just 12k numbers so defensively he's a little bit better now I wouldn't say that this deck immediately replaces MLB because it, it's missing some of the things that MLB still has like retire effects and really good consistent rear guard columns uh, but it has a really consistent game plan. Get ultimate Dayusha, his crit, and his uh, 13k base as fast as possible. You have access to really cool cards like Commander Laurel, who's really splashable in Vanguard Zero now, which is super nice. And you just have a really cool solid early game you could call it with Goyusha and regular Dayusha. So you can pressure your opponent a lot with this deck and it makes it a lot more viable, especially uh, when we get like more and more limit break cards because having anything with a guaranteed crit is always a nice thing. So that's about it for the Dimensional Robo support. Let's talk a little bit about the Galactic Beast or like the villain support for Dimension Police. So like I said, the main thing we get is the Zeal, Ride Chain, Larva Beast Zeal, Eye of Destruction Zeal, Devourer of Planet Zeal, and the big boy himself, Galactic Beast Zeal. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna talk mainly about Galactic Beast Zeal because he kind of sums up what all the other cards do. He has a lot of skills in Vanguard Zero now, so let's talk about them. The first one, really simple, Vanguard Circle. If Devourer of Planets is in your soul, power plus 1k at all times, 11k base, ride chain stuff, makes sense. The second skill is going to be his Limit Break skill, which is once per turn, Counterblast 2 to have all of your opponent's units get power minus 1,000 for each of your units until end of turn. Retire all those rear guards with power zero or less. So this is the big shtick of the villains or beast archetype in Dimension Police. They lower the rear guards and the vanguards power so that way you can hit them for harder with less. So instead of building up your vanguard, you sort of weaken your opponent's vanguard. And in Vanguard Zero, they added this really cool thing where if you lower something to zero, it actually gets retired if it's a rear guard, which is super strong. Kind of lets this deck be a little disruptive slash controlly, which is kind of nice. Third skill that they gave him is just a buff. It's a brand new skill, never had it before. When this unit attack hits a vanguard, 
Persona Blast to have one of your opponent's units get power minus 5,000, and then you can retire that rear guard with zero power or less. So this is actually a really cool utility thing. Again, more disruption, but it's really early. It's not limit break reliant. So you can like snipe starters with this effect, which is honestly pretty cool, or like really weak rear guards. You can combo this really cool with your on ride effects of Devourer of Planets and Eye of Destruction potentially to lower several cards and get some really good great one snipes. So I really like this option of just like control for Galactic Beasts in the archetype, which is super cool. Now, while I don't think Dimension Police as a whole becomes like a top tier clan, I definitely think both of these decks are super viable in set seven format because they have a really cool sort of balance between the two. You have the super aggressive, super consistent, super like beat stick, ultimate Great Ayusha deck. And then you have the really just like neat and wacky Galactic Beast. And, and then you have like the really neat and wacky like Galactic Beast Zeal deck that will probably play like stand triggers. So you can like clear boards by like sniping back row units and then using your effect just to make your opponent weaker. So even if they check defensives, you can still hit them after stand triggers. So I really like the kind of like niche both these decks fill within their clan and it does raise their viability. Plus, Great Ayusha is Great Ayusha, so I imagine a lot of people will play him just because they love him so much. So while this clan may not be tier one, it will definitely be played a lot and for good reason because it's honestly super good. Up next, we have Bermuda Triangle. Now, Bermuda Triangle gets uh, probably a hefty amount of support in this set and a lot of really important support. I would say this is their best support until Prisms come out, so that's really cool. Um, I don't think it'll be like the best deck to come out for Bermuda Triangle because Prisms is way better than Coral, but Coral is pretty cool. So let's talk about Coral for a little bit. That's the main like archetype that gets supported uh, in this set. And again, it's a ride chain. Uh, it's a really interesting ride chain too. You have this really cool, um, it's kind of like the uh, Artemis ride chain if you're familiar with how that works. Uh, Win Road by Fresh Star Coral, the grade one. Look at the top seven cards from your deck. Add Aurora Star or Shining Star Coral to your hand. If not, call this card to Rear Guard Circle. Win Road upon, call this card. So if anything that's not Fresh Star Coral gets called, you can call it out. So it works a lot like Vortimer and Artemis, which is super cool. Now, the three big boss cards that come out for Bermuda Triangle are Eternal Island Pacifica, Aurora Star Coral, and Shangri-La Star Coral. So first things first, let's just get this out the way. Aurora Star Coral is only in the deck to be put in for free. You almost never actually hard ride Aurora Star Coral if you have the option not to, because if you go directly into Shangri-La Star Coral, she has the Limit Break skill, count last one once per turn to get power plus 3,000 and end of turn, return one of your rear guards to your hand and put a Coral card from your hand into your soul if you do draw two cards. So like I said previously, Coral draws a lot of cards. You're filtering for other Coral pieces. And then once you get them, you shove them in your soul. And thanks to that, you can draw more cards and gain cross ride potential thanks to Aurora Star Coral. So unlike like Reindeer or Riviere, Coral is a very defensive, I'm gonna keep everything in my hand. I'm gonna draw more cards. I'm gonna have a perfect board every single turn because I have all the cards I want in my hand and it'll be cross ride. So your turn. So that's why Coral's gonna be super good. And I think that's like a niche that Bermuda Triangle never really had up until now, which is super nice. And then I wanna briefly mention the other limit break card they get. They get Eternal Island Pacifica, uh, which is the cross ride for top Island Pacifica, the Mega Blast from set two. Uh, Vanguard Circle, limit break four. When this unit attacks a Vanguard, count last two to return up to two of your rear guards to your hand and call a card from your deck. So this is mid battle guaranteed superior call multi-attack i think this will be your backup grade three in coral that you can go into late game to try and push for damage after you have coral sort of be like your defensive slash advantage wall throughout the game but there's going to be a bunch of different deck lists out there i'm not sure what the best one's going to be up until now but just know that this will be the best version of Bermuda triangle probably until prisms come out honestly whether or not it actually becomes tier one is i think completely dependent on how many people play it i think the tools are there for the deck to be super consistent and win you the games that you need to but whether or not people actually play it is a different story. All right, we have three other clans to talk about. Two of them are released in set seven, and the other one is going to be a special thing that I want to talk about specifically for this format. But the last two clans we have to talk about are going to be super easy. They don't get much. Uh, literally, I think we get like five or six cards for each one. So not much to talk about. And the first one's going to be Angel Feather. And the big thing Angel Feather gets they get the Crimson Drive cards, but but the big one is gonna be Crimson Impact Metatron and all of her accoutrement attached with her. So if you guys don't know, this is like a superior ride in Angel Feather. It has like the same superior ride mechanics as I think Ezel. So you have the grade zero, the grade one, the two, you can superior call into the grade three, which is Metatron. 
and she has two skills. The first one, when this attack, the first one when this unit attacks a Vanguard, Palpus 3 can't under that battle, super simple. And then the second one, the main one, is going to be Limb Break 4, Counter Blast 1 once per turn, and put two of your rear guards into your damage zone face down to call two cards from your damage zone. So you take two guards on your board, put them in, take two more guards, take them out. So it's a very simple effect, and you're probably wondering why is this special? Uh, is this even good? The answer is of course it is, because what it does is it allows you to sort of manipulate and have utility with cards like Calamity Flame, um, your Pegasus, and your No Seal. So not only will you get the extra power added to Million Ray by putting two cards in, which is awesome, you also get the chance to call two cards out. And say you call two more No Seals, well now you can essentially add more cards to your hand and put more cards back in. So say I did like everything perfect, I have two Million Ray, I have two whatever cards, I use Metatron's thing, I put the two whatever cards in the damage zone, I call out two No Seals, let's say they're both grade ones, I added four cards to my damage and that's turn, that's plus eight to each mil to each Million Ray, and then I get to filter my hand to whatever I want it to be, which is super strong. So while Metatron may not be like some big wub wombo super powerful card, it adds a lot to your aggressive consistency, which is one of the things that Angel Feather has been lacking, I think, throughout the set six and five formats. And so while this again does not make it like the best deck in the game, it gives it a nice breath of fresh air that I think will let people be like, you know what, I'm gonna play Angel Feather today. But I will add to that with the announcement of Celestials coming out in Vanguard Zero, honestly, it's okay to skip out on Metatron if you really don't wanna play it because better stuff is coming. Finally, closing off the set seven clans, we have Great Nature. And unlike Angel Feather, even though this clan has very little support, it is amazingly impactful. So let's talk about this. We get Gardening Mold. He's worse than Blackboard Parrot. Don't play him. We get the Vocal Chicken Melodica Cat, I think. Yeah, Melodica Cat and Recorder Dog. Uh, sort of archetype, I don't even know what you want to call it, Th those cards come out and uh, they're cool because they superior call each other when they get retired. I think the grade one calls the grade three, the grade three calls the grade two, and the grade two calls the grade one. Uh, the only two that you really use are the grade three and the grade two because you want to retire the grade three to call it the grade two during your end phase and get more intercepts. You don't really want to use the dog to get your grade three because that means you're losing a trigger. So just, just know that for now. The, the, the best two of these cards is gonna be Vocal Chicken and Melodica Cat. But the big card, the one that I'm excited about, the one that you guys know I love and I cannot wait to start playing on day one. I plan on building this deck as soon as possible. Uh, Battle of the Twin Rush Polaris, Mr. Coca-Cola Bear himself. He has two main skills. The first one being when this unit attacks a Vanguard, power plus 3000 on that battle. And the second one being Limit Break 4, when this unit attacks a Vanguard, Counter Blast 1 to stand one of your rear guards, and that unit gets power plus 4,000 until end of that turn. At the end of the battle, retire that unit. Now, really quickly, this is a buff. Uh, in the real game, it was Counter Blast 2, not Counter Blast 1. Super awesome. That's all I want in the buff, if I'm honest. Now, what makes this card so strong? Why is this the saving grace that Grey Nature needed? Well, basically, the big problem that Grey Nature had, it had the consistency. It had, like, the aggressive ability. It had the super cool combo potential and the really powerful late game. But what it lacked was guaranteed aggression. And in Limit Break format, having guaranteed consistent aggression every single game is super huge to push your opponent into situations that make you be be able to win the game so all this advantage all this tempo blah 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 blah. we couldn't really take advantage of it with cards like leopold and locks but with cards like polaris we totally can we can have guaranteed four attacks every single turn all of them getting super buff maybe even having twenty six thousand power if you if we utilize our binoculus and our leopold combos correctly and then at the end of the turn we get more cards back thanks to duck bills thanks to cats or we lose nothing thanks to stamp sea otter and it's just gonna be a super amazing option for the Great Nature deck that I think will make it rise in its viability in terms of power. I think this one card makes Great Nature a tier one deck well into Break Ride era. And the future, when we get cards like Shea Noir and Leopold Reverse, you know I'm gonna be rocking the Great Nature deck list every single god darn day, and I'm super excited. This card's honestly super amazing, takes away nothing from the deck's main strategy, and all it does is give you the one thing you've been missing the entire entire time from set five. Thank you Bushy and Game Studio for making this card everything I wanted it to be and more. 
Okay guys, that does it for like the discussion on the main set seven clans. Now I wanted to briefly take a little break here for a second and talk about the main differences between the global meta and the Japanese meta because this will make me talk about another clan in just a second. Now the big difference that I want to kind of mention is twofold. The first one being that we have a bunch more players. We have probably, if this is a nice estimate, 15, maybe 10, I'll say 10. We have 10 times the amount of players in the global server. So just looking at the JP meta and how like they acted, you know, where everyone, their mom played Aqua Force for like the entire month, you know, while that might be a good sign of, oh, people are going to love Aqua Force. I don't want to, I don't want you to think like, oh, it's going to be exactly like that. And I definitely don't want to tell you it's going to be exactly like that. So that's going to be my number one thing is that we have a bunch more players. So the way we're going to act is going to be different. It won't be ecologically relevant to sort of relate to the Japanese meta that much for the set seven release and the second big difference is that we actually get a new clan that they never had before we get tachikaze that's right guys we have confirmation from the september schedule released by vanguard zero over on twitter that we are getting the azaki event in the middle of september so unlike jp we're not gonna have to wait until set eight to have access to the big dinos they're actually gonna be meta relevant because they're coming out i would argue when they were supposed to come out so that's super dope and what does this mean? Does this mean that decks like Aqua Force or Grey Nature or Narukami just aren't gonna be played? No, of course not. They're still gonna be played as much as they were without this deck existing. But what this means is that we have another deck to sort of affect the meta that actually will be used. Because the big problem with Tachikaze when it came out wasn't that the deck was bad, it was that other things were just better and more hype because Ultimate Break and Glory Maelstrom and Platinum Ezel and the blood and all that fun stuff were coming out so no one had a reason to play Tachikaze. So that's a big deal. This clan will be a viable option given the support it has and I think the support it has is actually super dope. So if you guys don't know how Tachikaze works, um, I've always explained it like this and maybe that's a bad way to do it but it's essentially bad <laughs> Shadow Paladins where their shtick is retiring their rear guards. but the big difference here is that these cards, a lot of them actually have effects when they are retired so you have actually like a really cool synergy there when you retire your cards so you may not always gain so much advantage or pressure when you retire but you will have some kind of synergy every time you retire so that's super cool and the two main archetypes we get uh, during the clan event are going to be the Rex archetype and the, I think it's called the Raptor series or the, the Raptor archetype. It's not really an archetype, it's more of a series, but that's super cool. And my favorite of these two is going to be the Raptor Ride Chain. And the reason why is because the Raptor Ride Chain, I think is one of the only Tachikaze archetypes ever that actually superior calls cards. So it's a Vortimer... Artemis, Coral, type ride chain, look at the top seven, add the other two. So when you ride on top of the grade one, you get a copy of the grade one. When you, run, when, you, when you ride on top of the grade two, you get a copy of the grade two. And then the grade three, Military Dragon Raptor Colonel is the main card that you'll be having as your Vanguard. He has two main skills. The main one for Vanguard Circle is if Military Dragon Raptor Captains in your soul, power plus 1,000. And then break four, when this unit attacks, count plus one and retire two of your rearguards to increase this unit's power into under that battle by both of their combined powers. So if I retire a grade one and a grade two, 9K and 7K, I get 16,000 power added to my 11K base. 27,000 power, super cool, plays around your opponent's defensive triggers. Now, while this card may not be like a super amazing card, you know, just having a really big Vanguard isn't the coolest thing. The point is that he retires cards, which procs so many other effects, like Citadel Dragon Brachio Castle, which is just like the recorder dog, cat, and uh, chicken that lets you superior call the other copies. So you have the grade three, you have the grade two, and the grade one. The grade one calls the grade three, the grade three calls the grade two, the grade two calls the grade one. You guys get it. And that lets you get multi-attacks against your opponent. So this one retires during the battle phase. So you can actually get multi-attacks on top of your Vanguard increasing in power, which has synergy, which is super cool. And to top it all off, you have another boss unit in Destruction Dragon Dark Rex, who is probably going to be the main finisher of the deck. And he has two main skills. The first one being Hand. Bind this card to have one of your units gain power plus 3,000. So you bind them from your hand give something 3k and the second skill is bind zone limit break four at the end of the battle your grade three or greater attacked if the attack did not hit during that battle retire three rear guards to ride this unit as stand and draw two cards super powerful like i said you have cards like brachio castle border and i think carrier that lets you refill your board again so again more multi-attacks 
more power gain, and actual multiple Vanguard attacks, that is a lot of pressure generated out of nowhere. So I really do think this is going to be a super aggressive deck in the format. I've always said that in limit break format, especially, the more aggressively consistent you are, the better. Given all these cards it has access to and all these cool little combos it can pull off, I think Tachikaze has actually a really strong power placement within the meta and because the oversaturation of set eight is not going to be a factor here i think people are actually going to want to play tachikaze so that'll naturally bring up its popularity by who knows how much and it's a clan event so it's gonna be a free to play type deck it might be really easy for you to build the deck it might be really hard for you depending on how you pull so i'm actually really interested to see if tachikaze shows up in the meta and if it does how does it impact the meta like what does it beat what does it lose to we don't really know because no one played it in jp so i figured it was my duty to report this to you guys and be like hey keep this one in the back of your mind kids it might be really good and we also have confirmation i think thanks to these boys right here that ancient dragons is coming out and while ancient dragons is going to be a separate thing from all these cards uh picking up your dark rex is going to be super important because this card is the best card in tachikaze for a very very long time so definitely keep that one in mind kids definitely get your hands on this card when the event rolls around. He's going to be important. But yeah, guys, that does it for the entirety of all the new clans, all the differences between the JP and English meta. Now that I've discussed sort of the matchup spreads, the strengths and weaknesses, and the effects of all these new clans that are coming out, it's time that I gave you guys my top three predictions for the best decks in the set seven format. Whoosh! So really quickly, before I get started with this, this is not going to be like my ranking. I'm not going to say like, oh, these are these are the best decks based on the Japanese meta. That's not how this works. These are my top three deck predictions, given everything I just told you guys about the strengths and weaknesses, the popularity, what the what the new clans do, etc., etc. That is what I'm basing these predictions on, as well as the existing meta and all the cards we currently have, and sort of the way that I think global players think. In a few weeks, once we have the actual meta going in set 7, I'll make a proper tier list talking about all the archetypes. So don't worry, that video will come out later. So, with that in mind, the third best deck, in my opinion, is going to be Narukami. I think Narukami will be as strong as it is right now. It is, like I've always said, the gatekeeper, the check, the, the go-to in the format right now. If you want to play a deck fast and get a guaranteed win or have a fun time on rank, you play Narukami. If you want to know if your deck is really good or not, test against Narukami. If you have a pretty okay time against it, your deck's probably super solid. So, I love Narukami. It's the gatekeeper of the format, and I think it stays that way well into set seven format it gains a couple of bad matchups i think i don't think great nature is that fun anymore uh with polaris because they're really aggressive against you in the late game and i think aqua force isn't like bad but it's not favorable i don't think the second best deck is going to be ml because MLB is still around, MLB is still a problem, MLB is still an issue for all of these new Limit Break decks, uh, it, it's still going to be a big deal even if it's nerfed, um, people will actually play MLB more I think in set 7 because I think they're expecting a lot more um, non Shadow Paladin, non damage adder decks like Great Nature potentially or even Dimension Police to come onto the format and they want to kind of hard counter that and sort of stop them in their tracks. So MLB is still going to be a big deck. Really quick, before I talk about the best deck, I want to give a quick honorable mention to Great Nature. I think Great Nature has everything it needs to become a best deck, but the only reason it's not in the top three is because I don't think that many people are actually going to bite the bullet and play it because for some reason, Great Nature has like this stigma or this stereotype with it that like, like, oh only big brains use great nature which i'm like okay i get that the cards are like based around nerdy animals but that doesn't mean you have to be like 1000 iq to play the deck it's actually really easy to use the deck once you use it a couple times so i don't like that trope but it, whatever it's a thing and it does affect the popularity of this deck all right enough dilly dallying what is the best deck for set seven what did you guys come here to learn it's aqua force now <laughs> I know that's probably not a surprise to you guys. I hyped up Aqua Force so much when I talked about the effects, and everyone is hyped about Aqua Force. But let me briefly just remind you everything Aqua Force has going for it. It has amazing support coming out later on. So it's going to be a deck that you want to invest in early and invest in now. It's going to be a popular deck because everyone and their mom loves Leon for some reason and Jaime, and they want to use Maelstrom. 
who knows why. And for set seven in particular, it is essentially blue Kagero. So any Kagero player out there that's like, oh man, I can't play Dote, but I can play Maelstrom. So that's gonna be the idea is I, is I think like, if you wanna play like tempo, aggression, advantage, and sort of rush in, in some regards, you're gonna wanna play Aqua Force. So it has a lot of options that a lot of people like to play. I think it's a really popular deck. And I think there's no reason not to think that everyone's gonna play it if they can get their hands on the cards. And given that we're gonna be having the, um, uh, Maelstrom events coming out soon people are gonna invest in it now and then like take their sweet time building it And then they're gonna definitely have it for set a format So yeah, I think all these factors powerful effects popularity Wanting to invest in it now So you may as well play it now as well are all gonna be big factors for why people pick up aqua force and then use it on ranked and Use it everywhere else. So those are my thoughts on what the best decks are sadly no other new things made it on here I think other more established decks are still gonna hold their own in set seven uh, there's still Gold Paladin and Spectruke's gonna be around, and, they'll, and, and then they'll be around a lot more during set A format. Shadow Duke will still be a thing because it's the best ranked deck because it's just so freaking fast. Uh, Dimension Police will be around because it's essentially D Police MLB, but MLB is still stronger because of the tools they have that D Police doesn't have. And there'll be a bunch of fun other decks. There'll be Coral, there'll be Got to Big Zeal. I'm not saying those decks aren't viable, I'm just saying that for now, these are what I think the majority of people are gonna be playing, and here's why. So, there you guys go. Those are my best deck predictions for the set seven format in Carpet Vanguard Zero. If you guys did enjoy, be sure to leave a like on this video, subscribe to the channel, and click that bell for notifications so that you guys know when my videos go live for you. If you guys have any questions about anything that I mentioned in this video that I have not answered already, leave them down in the comments below, or better yet, hop into my Twitch channel. I go live every Monday, Thursday, Friday. I do all kinds of things in just chatting, and I play a lot of Vanguard Zero. So, come ask some questions and hopefully get some answers. I'm probably live right now actually over on Twitch uh, with my charity stream for Autism Speaks. So if you guys want to come talk about this video right now, that will be the best place to do so. Link down below to both the campaign and my stream. And with that being said, you guys, as always, I have been your true champion, Steven. Please be sure to work hard, rest easy, and live well, and I'll see y'all next time. Peace.